Lowry legacy, ticket prices, and where are the Raptors, all in yet old mailbag. A wide variety of queries in here as NBA free agency slows down and the torch goes out in Tokyo. Have fun and we'll see what normal feels like in the coming slow weeks. Q, so now that we look like we have a team that is full of various versions of Bismack Biombo 2.0, who actually does the scoring for the team this season? Or do they lose a bunch of closely contested games, say, 85 to 75? Levity aside, the team has great versatility and tremendous defensive chops, but are they actually a low-seed playoff contender, or are there a few more drafts slash trades to come to elevate them in the years ahead? All the best. Marshall A. A. Scoring might be an issue, as might shooting be, for sure. But points tend to pile up from unlikely places in such situations and there's a chance one of proven NBA scorers like Siakam, Van Vliet, Trent, Anunobi have breakthrough years. And they could very well lose a lot of games 85-75, to 75, they might win a bunch 87-82, to 82, too. J. I don't think for a second Ujiri and Webster are done and I don't expect them to be done until after February's trade deadline. Q. Hello Doug. Now that Masai has signed, hooray, and Lowry is leaving town, sniff, sniff, what do you recommend we bug you about next? Santino. A. Siakam trade? Tanking? Trust me, you'll find something. Q. I hope this find you enjoying a cold one on a patio somewhere. Thankfully Rogers slash the fan have returned to a radio broadcast of the Blue Jays game. They have gone with Ven Scully model. No color man. I like it. What do you think? Adam wets time. A. I've only heard a couple of innings one night while driving so really don't have an opinion or enough experience to form one. But no one, no one, can pull off a one-person booth like Scully and no one ever will. Q. Hi Doug. Trust this email finds you and yours in good health. Two questions. I recall that Nando de Colorado's rights were held by the Raps. If so what happened? In the nosebleed seats we loved Reggie Slater. Do you have anecdotes about him? Cheers. Frank B. A. The Raptors actually still hold the Colorado's rights and keep them year to year in case he can be used in some transaction. But he makes so much money and has such a good life playing in Europe, no way he comes back. Don't have a lot of Reggie Slater anecdotes from when he was a player but he does stay in touch with some folks from the organization and I ran into him at a Toronto Rockets game in Houston, where he runs a thriving auto parts slash repair business. Q. That's a championship farewell column by you about Kyle Lowry, many thanks, Doug. You offer an overview of his career with us here in Toronto, describing the engaging mix of traits that is KL. What stands out for me is the way you describe Lowry's career. Lowry has described himself as a professional basketball player. That is his job, his profession. It strikes me that there was something enduring and modest in the way he says that, and in the way he goes about it. We have things to learn from Kyle Lowry about how one becomes a professional. Your thoughts? Charles N. A. The interesting thing about Lowry, and I've been thinking about him a bit this week with all the stories we've had to do, is that he somehow stayed true to himself but changed, if you know what I mean. He's still headstrong and a bit of a contrarian, as he was when he got here, but he somehow learned to use those traits to bring people into him rather than shoving them away. That's no mean feat and something people should aspire to as they mature. I think. Q. Hi Doug. This might be a loaded question and topic, but here goes. I am a long-time Raptors season ticket holder. Just recently heard that the National Bank, nay Rogers Cup, tennis will be held this year starting on August 7th. Going on the tennis website there are many restrictions in regard to attendance at the same including health checks, online tickets only and access to center court stadium with only lower bowl tickets and physical distancing. Limited parking not guaranteed, and mass public transportation is discouraged. No access to the grounds and you are only allowed in one hour before your scheduled tennis session. You also have to wear a mask at all times except for drinking and eating and food is to be ordered from the seats on your phone and delivered there. You cannot roam the concourse of the stadium and can only leave to go to the washrooms. However, the price of the tickets seems to be roughly the same as in ordinary pre-pandemic times. My question is this. Nobody knows what the Raptors will do when the season begins in November. But the Scotiabank Arena is an indoor stadium so I would assume that many of the above restrictions or even more may be in effect. Being a season ticket holder, do you think that it is proper or correct that we should be paying full price to attend the games? Clearly, 
it will not be the same experience that we are used to in normal pre-pandemic times. I know that all the sports venues and team now need to maximize revenues but I just hope they do not take advantage of fans who they think will be starved to see and attend the games in person again. Attending professional sports games are expensive enough to begin with and I am really not sure how I will feel about the same, once we find out about the numerous and various restrictions to attend the games. What do you think and what do you think is a fair solution? Reduction in prices of the tickets, highly unlikely, suspension of your season tickets until normalcy returns. Difficult considerations for the Raptors and all sports teams to consider. Also, the Raptors just announced that all the tickets will be virtual with no printed tickets. Do you think this will eliminate the scalpers outside the arena on game day? How do you buy a virtual ticket from a scalper? All the best. Eddie. Hey, yes, I think it's absolutely fine to charge full price for tickets to sports events, movies, plays, concerts. And have no problem with any restrictions given the current circumstances. I think teams should give ticket holders an option to come back if they decline for, maybe, one season, I also think teams should and will put into effect rules regarding vaccination, mask wearing, and testing before anyone's allowed in a building or stadium. Teams and leagues have been moving to paperless ticketing for some time and it doesn't seem to have stemmed the scalping tide too much so I don't expect that to change either. Q, hi Doug. Thanks for doing your thing in a way that informs and entertains readers, all this during a pandemic that has changed the way your job is done, not to mention while recovering from a major health crisis. We forget about the daily grid people endure all while we fret over the future of our raptors. Kyle's gone, Messiah is staying, and the draft is done, and no spectacular free agents signed. An Olympics question for you. As much as I enjoy the games, I've always been disappointed that more isn't done to integrate Paralympics athletes into the spectacle. In past years, it's always packed stadiums for two weeks, billions of viewer, then everyone leaves and it's like, we're done, okay, now the disabled athletes can do their thing. I think they should stagger Paralympic events and Olympic events in the same venue whenever possible. Give the Paralympics athletes the attention they deserve. The closest comparison I can think of is the NHL skills competition recently when female players demonstrated the events. Fans watching NHL All-Stars were exposed to how good the female players are. Thoughts? Bernie M. Hey, I certainly see your point, it could very well draw eyes to the Paralympics, which is always good. But I wonder, sadly, if it might get lost in the other Olympics. I also wonder about the feasibility of it, schedule-wise, facilities-wise and I don't know if it would work. I think the thing is to have more media coverage of the Paralympics as their own standalone event. Q, hi Doug. A few months ago in an interview Kyle Lowry said when he retires from the NBA it will be as a Raptor. Do you see that eventuality taking place? Brian into. Hey, I suppose there might be a way in three or five years from now for Lowry to sign a one-year, non-guaranteed deal and then be waived as a symbolic way for him to retire as a Raptor. Is it necessary for his legacy? Absolutely not. Q, hey Doug. Hope you are well. Quite a week, thank you for staying up at all hours of the night to write about the Tokyo Games. This is now the second straight games that Canadian women have won significantly more medals than the men. The 1992 medals went mostly to Canadian men, medals were about evenly split at the 1996, 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012. Why has this happened? Are the women's programs better than the men's? There's been a fair amount of chatter in Hoops Media that the Raptors are looking at trading Siakam, supposedly due to the rift between him and Nurse. While you have noted in the past that no one is immune from being raided, do you think these stories are accurate? Recognizing that the Raps roster may not be finalized at this point, at this point, who do you think would finish games for the Raptors, ruling out foul trouble, variables about the opponents, injuries, etc. Finally, while I am disappointed Lowry has left the fold, I hope he does well with the heat. I noticed that the AP's Tim Reynolds tweeted that he hopes the Raptors won't be asked to play in Miami on Christmas Day. On the other hand, if the Heat's first visit to Toronto were to come on December 25th, that would be rather spectacular, I think. Toronto has decided to rename Dundas Street, and it would certainly be special if the street were to be renamed Lowry Avenue. It cuts across the heart of the city and ends up in your neck of the woods. Would be a fitting tribute, no? Appreciate it as always. Phil. Hey, boy, 
Lots to unpack here so I'll run through them quickly. I really have no theory about the current disparity in medal winners, women versus men, but think we should just celebrate them all rather than look for any deep meaning at the moment. I do not expect Sayakam to be traded any time soon, nor do I think there was much veracity to many of the reports. Guessing the Raptors would close some games with Van Vliet, Anunobi, Sayakam, Barnes, and Birch maybe? No, naming one of the central thoroughfares through the streets of Toronto after an athlete who was here for less than a decade is not a thing I think anyone should ever contemplate. We need to not get carried away. Q, hi Doug. I am going to be 79 next month and in all those years I cannot think of a similar situation to the Masayujiri saga. We are all still up in the air as to his status and whether he is coming or going. How does a team properly function under this cloud? It is beyond me. Secondly it would seem that the Raptors are in a full-blown rebuild and the next few years or so might not be very pretty. It is also apparent that Toronto is not now and never will be a destination that players want to come to regardless of their champion season a couple of years ago. Raptor players flock to LA and Miami but the other way not so much. I predict at least one of the big three of Sayakam, Anunobi, or Van Vliet will be traded before the start of the 2022-2023 season and perhaps before the start of this season. Stan. A. I'll let the Maasai thing go because it's been resolved as well all know and it really never, ever, ever was a thing in the industry. And if you think a team that was on its way to 60 wins two seasons ago and will return four of five starters and the first three or four players off the bench from last year while adding the number four pick in the draft, a young first round pick and a 13 year veteran guard is in a full blown rebuild, you couldn't be more wrong. Q. That was a delightful tribute to Lowry you composed last Monday starting with a compelling image that compared talking to reporters to a root canal. Exploring, social media, something I do with trepidation, turned up an amusing photo of Lowry and Smith apparently being mean to a photographer, and no doubt there's a story there. Personally, I don't expect to see his like again, unless I see another player take three charges in an all-star game, not holding my breath. Another image that sticks is his rescuing of Ojeri after the latter was assaulted following Game 6. One has to appreciate the fact that he didn't just leave without the Raptors getting a return, and without leaving a successor in place in the person of Fred. Still, it's professional sport so moving right along is what we do. It was perfectly in character for this front office to not make the safe pick, Jalen Suggs, at number 4. The bump on Scotty Barnes has been great fun, he is anywhere from 6, 7 to 6, 10, and growing, his shot is either irretrievably broken, just needs a few tweaks, or hasn't been taken enough to tell, he is possibly the second coming of Michael Carter Williams, or is it Magic Johnson? His likely position is somewhere between point guard and center. All in all, there is lots to daydream about for Raptor fans where young Mr. Barnes is concerned. At the moment, the popular thing in the NBA seems to be loading up on 30-something players. Toronto's front office is clearly going in a different direction, although I'd have no difficulty if they kept Dragic around. I've always been a fan and his career has a weird symmetry with Lowry's from the time they competed for a job in Houston. James A., Victoria. P.S., that was an insightful question you asked Banton, so insightful that a couple of others repeated it. What an interesting guy he is, another rookie to anticipate. A., I would imagine Toronto will work out to have one of the youngest teams in the league if they move Dragic but the funny part is that four of younger players have all won championships in Toronto.